This video will discuss performing a thoracentesis at Boston University Medical Center. The American Board of Internal Medicine requires competency in a number of procedures listed here. For the core internal medicine bedside procedures such as central line placement, lumbar puncture, thoracentesis, and paracentesis, it is important to know, understand, and explain the indications, contraindications, complications, sterile techniques, and to be able to appropriately handle the specimens, interpret the results, and gather informed consent. The ABIM stops short of requiring a minimum number of procedures for board eligibility, but notes that each resident should ideally be an active participant in each procedure at least five times. Unfortunately, many internal medicine residents report being inadequately trained, and program directors agree that many graduating residents do not master the essential procedural skills. This video is part of a curriculum to enhance procedural education at Boston Medical Center and will focus on what is essential knowledge for board eligibility. When considering whether your patient needs a thoracentesis, there are two generally accepted indications, those done for diagnostic purposes in order to determine the etiology of an unknown effusion and those for therapeutic purposes or symptomatic improvement of dyspnea. Like any procedure, thoracentesis may be associated with increased risks in several situations. While the appropriate coagulation profile to safely perform a thoracentesis is not known, it is generally accepted that INR is greater than 1.5 normal, platelets less than 25,000, and creatinines greater than 6 are associated with increased risks of bleeding. Positive pressure ventilation is not a true contraindication. However, some studies have shown an increased rate of pneumothorax in ventilated patients and an increased risk of developing tension or persistent air leak should a pneumothorax occur. Small or loculated effusions require an advanced operator done under image guidance, either ultrasound or CT, and should not be done by the intern operator alone. Lastly, care must be taken not to traverse areas of superficial infection when accessing the pleural space as theoretical seating can occur. This is the consent form at Boston Medical Center. Unfortunately, BMC supplies a blank consent form for this procedure and relies on the operator to insert the name of the procedure, details, and associated risks. All too often, it is common for consent forms just to be listed with the medical name of the procedure alone, like thoracentesis. This is an inadequate consent and would not appropriately document a discussion of the risk benefits of such a procedure, even if it did in fact happen. After consent, a timeout is then performed. This is a joint commission requirement during which the operator and another individual, usually the nurse caring for the patient, perform a checklist to confirm the correct patient, procedure, side, and other necessary items. At BMC, all individuals, including the nurse and MD operators, must initial the green timeout sticker, which is placed on the reverse side of the consent form. After consent and timeout, the equipment can be set up. All the equipment pictured here is required including a mask, sterile gown, gloves, sterile table cover, extra chlorhexidine swabs, and a cardinal thoracentesis kit, product TPT 1000 SP. While this kit is labeled and approved for performing a thoracentesis and paracentesis, at BMC it is only used for a thoracentesis. We have found, along with other hepatology experts, that the larger plastic catheter supplied in this kit is associated with increased complications and kinking when used for a paracentesis, so I've implemented a separate paracentesis kit manufactured by Kimberly Clark. The kit includes most of the necessary items, including a chlorhexidine swab for a final prep, a patient drape, a small bed drape, two anesthesia needles and lidocaine, gauze, and a thoracentesis needle with overlying catheter along with wide tubing and a collection bag. Most patients you will be performing a thoracentesis on will be in a sitting position with their back towards the operator and arms draped over a pillow on the table. This allows any dependent fluid to layer inferiorly with gravity. With experience, the procedure can also be done with relatively immobile patients or intubated patients in the lateral decubitus position with the head slightly raised Usually, in order to have enough room to work, the side which you are draining is placed up. 
as with any bedside procedure, hand washing with either an alcohol-based product or soap and water is essential before patient contact. The traditional site to perform a thoracentesis is located 5 to 10 centimeter lateral to the spine, at least one or two interspaces below the top of the fusion, as determined by physical exam, and not below the ninth rib. Additional studies, notably one Japanese study using CTs to localize the intercostal artery location in relation to the inner space, have found that the intercostals are more reliably located tucked underneath the rib the more lateral one looks, and therefore less likely to be punctured during the procedure. It is for this reason, along with the thick paraspinal muscles lying just medial to the spine, that we do not prefer performing thoracentesis too medially. With the advent of ultrasound, many of these rules have changed. Ultrasound has definitively shown to decrease complication rates and increase success rates. It allows for the access of small or loculated effusions located at other areas around the chest, such as very lateral or even anteriorly. It is absolutely imperative in this day and age for the internal medicine residents to have knowledge of using ultrasound to access pleural fluid. Understanding how fluid is localized with ultrasound begins with reviewing how a pleural effusion looks in the sagittal plane. As you remember, a sagittal plane is one that cuts the body as would a lateral chest x-ray. The reformatted CT scan on the left is a normal scan, showing lung, diaphragm, spleen, left ventricle cut and cross-section, and rib cage cut and cross-section. When a patient has a dependent pleural effusion and is sitting up, the fluid labors posteriorly and inferiorly as seen in the scan on the right. The lung is compressed into a small airless wedge now simply floating in the fluid. The curvilinear probe is then used to scan in such a plane, orientating the probe in a longitudinal axis. An overlying image of the respective ultrasound produced is shown, and you could see how this correlates to the CT scan. Therefore, the area farthest from the probe represents anatomically anteriorly, the area closest is anatomically posteriorly, and superior and inferior areas are marked. The actual ultrasound image, however, is customarily rotated 90 degrees counterclockwise on the screen to appear as shown. Now, the bottom part of the picture is anatomically anterior, the top of the picture is anatomically posterior, to your left is anatomically superior, and to your right is anatomically inferior. Here is the actual visit video and do take note of the collapsed airless lung, the left ventricle, the fluid which appears to be flowing, and the diaphragm. Usually a dark black streak will be visible emanating from the top of the screen called the rib shadow, which represents the rib in cross section, which in effect is blocking the lower transmission of all the ultrasound waves. Once an appropriate site is selected, it is marked taking note of the top edge of the rib. A sterile table is set up, and the site is sterilized with chlorhexidine. The patient is then draped with a window drape. Lidocaine is provided in the thoracentesis kit in a glass vial that must be carefully snapped to open. Because small shards of glass may be produced, the lidocaine is drawn up with the provided filter needle. Anesthesia is done first with a 23 gauge needle producing a small superficial wheel. Next, a longer and larger gauge needle is used to anesthetize the deeper tissues all the way to the pleura. Care must be taken to deliberately aim for the superior edge of the rib, ensure contact, and provide anesthesia directly to the periosteum, then gradually work superiorly and over the rib to the pleura. It is not uncommon for patients to report increased pain or flinch when the pleural space is entered, and additional anesthesia should be given at this step during withdrawal. An incision is made in the transverse orientation along the ribs to avoid laceration. The thoracentesis needle is introduced, which as a reminder is a long metal needle with an overlying plastic catheter. The metal needle is used as a trocar over which the plastic catheter is introduced. The needle is anchored and stabilized near the skin with one hand, while the other hand both advances the apparatus and withdraws back on the syringe. When fluid is encountered, the entire needle is advanced just slightly to ensure that it is completely within the pleural space. Then, 
the plastic catheter slid along the metal needle into the patient. Of note, a common source of confusion is that one must remember that the needle and catheter begin to separate at the black hub. Once the catheter is pushed fully in, the needle is completely removed and the one-way valve can be heard sealing. Next, the tubing is attached. There are three ends to the tubing. The Y end is attached to a 50cc syringe. The longer end, without a small one-way valve, is attached to the collection bag. And lastly, the shorter end with a one-way valve in line is attached to the side port of the catheter. The fluid is then pumped out with the 50cc syringe. Once again, using the one-way valve system, if it's correctly attached, allows the fluid to flow only out of the patient and prevents air entrainment. Therefore, with each 50cc pump, it is not necessary to open or close any three-way stopcock. It is often helpful to measure pleural pressures in cases where a trap lung is suspected or when doing very large volume thoracentesis to prevent dropping the pleural pressure too greatly. This is done by leaving the tubing connected but disconnecting the 50cc syringe. Now, the tubing filled with pleural fluid can serve as a makeshift manometer. It is brought next to the patient and raised or lowered until the point just when the pleural fluid is dripping out. As you can see, this operator needed to lower the tube to around four centimeters below the catheter entry point before fluid comes out, meaning the pleural pressure is negative four centimeters of water. Once the desired amount of fluid is taken or the fluid flow stops, the catheter is removed with the pleural pressure positive to prevent entrainment of air. This is done with the patient humming or exhaling. Pressure is held and a band-aid is applied. It is imperative to correctly process the specimen so the appropriate studies are done. I find that introducing the pleural fluid from your 50cc syringe into individual blood tubes like this is best. A cell count is run off the anticoagulated purple top tube with chemistries done from a yellow or orange SST tube. It is also helpful to instill 10 cc's or so into a completely empty tube such as a white top tube, a clear tube, or a urine container for other studies or microbiologic studies. Each individual tube must be labeled with the patient sticker. My policy also is to clamp the collection bag, label it with the patient sticker, and send the entire bag to cytology in hopes of providing them enough sample so a centrifuge cell block can be made. Additionally, cytology will not accept specimens in glass containers because of the risk of breakage during transport. Any excess fluid should be disposed of in a large red bin in the dirty utility room. Oral fluid tests include a cell count, chemistries, particularly LDH and protein, pH, cytology, and potentially other disease-specific tests such as ADA or ANA. The main decision is whether the urofusion represents a transidate or exudate. A transidate is characterized by a bland, non-inflammatory collection of fluid caused by an imbalance of hydrostatic or on oncotic forces. An exudate, on the other hand, forms from inflammation or impaired lymphatic drainage and is associated with a higher protein, cell count, and chemistry values. The causes of transidates are listed here with congestive heart failure being one of the most common, but also including hepatic hydrothorax, nephrotic syndrome, and the others listed. And here is a list of the most common cause of exudates. The biochemical criteria for transidate versus exudate is Light's criteria and should be committed to memory. As with any bedside procedure, thoracentesis has potential complications, including pain and coughing as the lung reinflates, re-expansion pulmonary edema, hemothorax, a pneumothorax rate of about 1% when ultrasound is used, and the intra-abdominal injury or infection from seating. Test x-ray is checked post-procedure to ensure there's no pneumothorax. However, the advent of ultrasound also lends the possibility of checking for a pleural slide sign to ensure that there's no pneumothorax. Lastly, a procedure note is typed. 
documenting the findings.